Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meet everyone, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron's Master Class. I see the professor is walking up to the podium. So, take a seat, get comfortable. The class is ready to begin. And merry meet everybody, and welcome to this week's Stirring the Cauldron Master Class. And for first-time listeners, the Masterclass and the regular Stirring the Cauldron shows rotate every week um, at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, every other week, actually. All right, so tonight the professor is Lily Alley, host of New and Now, and it's here on Para-X right after this show, um, Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern. And she's going to be talking about curses and banishings. And, you know, as always, if you're listening to the live show and you're in the Para-X chat room, we welcome you to ask questions and comments during the class. And if you'd like to join us, there's still time to come over to paraxradionetwork.com. So, Lily, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. You, you, you got to, you know, I, I have to say that you got the right thing to talk about because you really know this stuff <laughs> yes i sort of lived it shall we say yeah on both ends yeah yeah both ends yeah <laughs> a little bit of cursing a little bit of banishing yeah it's, as i yeah. always refer to it i wouldn't let john use the word curse in front of me i would say fling fling and flung <laughs> okay because, you know that's what he did that's what he was um capable of because um he and I agreed on a lot of things about cursing, and John Alley was an amazing, um, to use the old phrase, dark magician, black magician, Satanist magician, whatever you want to use, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was with him 11 wonderful years until he succumbed to cancer. And what I learned from him, what was fascinating, after a few years together, we realized that as much alike as we were, we never fought over the remote. As much alike as we were, we were totally different in the way we looked at magic. Okay. He mm-hmm. saw curses as a very um, seldom used but very important, shall we say, skill. Okay. Mm-hmm. In his bag of tricks. I, of course, will always go the nicer way. And as we talked, it, it made sense to teach others and to share with others that there are more than one way um, to skin the cat. Pardon me, my poor cat. Um, <laughs> but um, there were more ways than one to approach it. And really to give somebody knowledge of magic, especially in the beginning years, they they really need to know both sides. And, you know, you can call it the right-hand path and the left-hand path. Um, there's many names for it, Okay. The right-hand path is usually the path of many. The left-hand path is the dark female side, and it's the path of yourself. In the left-hand path, you're being, whereas in the right-hand path, you're becoming. And it shocks people when I say to people, Christianity is included in the right-hand path, okay? And um, Wicca, on many levels, is included in the right-hand path. But as we got together, we figured there was a center path. And um, I recently was talking with someone, and you're going to laugh, Marla, about, you know, the right and the left hand path in Star Wars. And this guy who had been intimately connected with the Star Wars, the first few movies, said to me, well, you know, George Lucas said that 
the Jedi weren't right either, and that there was the center path that would have been a better place. And I said, oh, my goodness, that's what I lived. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I, I lived that's that. True. Because yeah. neither, you know, the hardest thing for John and I, though I got called the Yoko Ono of Satanism and all this crap, um, <laughs> the hardest thing for me to deal with was the fact I didn't want to affect him on his path. And he didn't want to affect me. And it didn't hurt that he was libertarian and I was sort of on the other side of things politically, too, because we learned to respect each other and talk it out and to agree to disagree if it got to the point where you're right or I'm right or, you know, you don't know. We didn't go there. Mm -hmm. And I want to say something. Um, You're talking about the right and the left. Um, That's how we met when you did a book. Yep. About yep. him and you and, you know, the good and the bad, so people were calling it. And I thought it was going to be a really interesting um, uh, talking about it because um, I thought, you know, we I think we said that John was Satanist, you know, for the book, for the whatever. You know, it, it looks well, better yeah. than that. And yeah. that you yeah. were, you know, like right. Wick, Wiccan and real easy and, and whatever. Um and so it just it was interesting because you know I would I was a little bit weirded out in the beginning because I mean satanist at at one point people are always going to say you can't have that on you know he's going to kill you or you know whatever it was oh, yeah. you should have seen when I started dating him <laughs> okay yeah, yeah. It, the messages I got were just unbelievable and they weren't just from Christians uh huh okay and I, well and what it what really broke it that you guys were in two different rooms in the house uh, one upstairs one up downstairs and i heard you guys talking and all of a sudden you said did you wash the bathtub or yep. something like yep. that yep. Yep. And, and i went oh my god <laughs> you know and i started laughing and that's when i started loving both of you <laughs> you know because here here's this satanist and you're yelling about the bathtub yep. you know and it yep. was it was really fun so yeah and and uh, John was a very good guy. I liked him a lot. And laid back. And yes. the reason I remember that we, I was complaining about the bathtub, I just have to say this to you, Marla, Marla is that um, he had washed Pugsley. Mm. Okay. They had sort of had a bath together. Mm-hmm. He had made, well, when you wash a dog, you always have a bath alongside because of the water. And mm-hmm. Pugsley was all of maybe three or four years old at that time. And... Um, Pugsley is sitting next to me right now, one less eye, but 19 years going. Wow. And it's amazing. He's another one who's a gift. And I told you on the phone, I got weirded out because I went to my usual restaurant where I I do, I do my prep my shows and I sit in a corner and have my computer there. Mm -hmm. And I found I'm going, John, you know, what do I talk about cursing? I'm not the one to talk about cursing. And so I just put cursing in my search engine for my computer to see if there was anything else that I had done besides the pagan pride things on cursing. Mm -hmm. And surprise, I found his master class on cursing. Ah. And for tonight, I'm sort of giving people a treat. This has never been really dealt with before in any depth on any show. And so the first half is, is Lily's approach. And the second half, I'm going to read it in the first person as if I was John. And they can not only see the differences, but the similarities. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, I'm going to take a step back. And like I said, you guys, if you have any questions, just you can put it in the chat room. You could put it in the um, uh, par- private bit and wherever you want to do, just so I can see it. And I'll get it to her. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to start on people, okay? We throw the words curses around. We throw the words I'll pray for you around. And do we really mean it? Recently, I had surgery, right? And all these people were calling me saying, I'll pray for you. And I'm sure some of them were very helpful in praying. And others were just spouting off words, okay? Now, words have power. I could argue with you that by them even just saying that to me was a blessing, okay? So what we say matters. And whether you're doing a positive spell or a curse, 
you have to say exactly what you mean. Because one of the best ways to curse anyone, and this is a psychological approach, is to give them exactly what they want. Think about this. I'm sure not so much the men listening, but the women know they had a friend that was, oh, I've got to date Joe. I've got to date Joe. He's the best guy ever. I've got to date him. I've got to date him. Okay. And yes, they might have done some little spells. They might have done their own glamour spell by being around him when they were all dressed up. But um, give them exactly what they want. And sometimes it's not at all what they want. And then you get to watch the implosion, which means you get to go eat popcorn. But here's the real deal with spells. Whereas it's helping you, the psychology is on you, if you will. Yes, you're sending it up to above, but it's still off changing you as you do the spell. So that's a lot of energy. Why use all that energy on a curse? Okay, when chances are, if you do your examination of conscience before you go to cursing, Chances are you really don't want them to be cursed. You may just want them away from you. And you can do that so much easier without throwing a curse. First of all, I have to tell you something. And I've seen this for years. The ones who brag about their power all the time to you. The ones who tell you how powerful a sorcerer they are, how they can do this or that. Guess what? They don't have any power. That's why they need to get energy from the mundane. Okay? So they're sort of fishing for compliments, if you will. Now, some are narcissistic with falsely inflated egos, and those are the ones you don't have to worry about because even if they say they're going to curse you, um, they're afraid to. And we'll get into that in John's class about where, you know, this is just a negative situation. But what about the situation where someone says they're going to curse you? And worse, you believe it. That's when things can go haywire. The other thing is the ones telling everyone how spiritual and religious they are, and they certainly would never curse. I mean, um, Young talked about these people, that they were hiding the dark side of themselves. Because let's face it, when we're angry, we're angry. Now, if you talk to do some self-talk and vent to some friends, they're going to tell you you're not that angry. Yeah, you're perturbed. But the ones who are very spiritual and religious and refuse to even look at that side of themselves, they will be the ones who they say never curse or bind. But I don't believe it. Because remember, words have power. Thoughts have power. So the worst curse I've ever heard of is what I call the Southern curse. I'm sure you've heard it before, too. I've never seen a more dangerous man. Bless his little heart. If he comes to me, I'll tell him what's what. Bless his little heart. If she comes near my husband, I know he won't do anything. But bless his little little heart. Bless her little heart, right? We've heard it. That's a curse. Surprise. They're no more blessing their little hearts than you and I are saying, you know, I love you to strangers. Okay? It's a a polite way of cursing someone. Yep, people will deny it. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Well, then how did you mean it? You said something very negative, and then you change it to bless his little heart. Hmm. Okay. Of course... For years, back in the 80s, this was my favorite joke, okay? Witches would be giggling about the New York City curse. I'm on the East Coast, Marla, I have to talk about this. <laughs> and how you do the New York City curses, you dedicate a pillowcase, okay? It doesn't matter whose pillowcase, you can go buy one, but dedicate it to your job. Now, place four large novena-style candles and glass in the pillowcase, Now, meditate, ground and center, and go outside and find the person causing you you harm, and guess what? Aim well. Just kidding. But Jen and I also always disagreed with each other. But to me, anger can be healthy, 
but more important, any emotion, especially anger, is energy. And since we just, energy doesn't go away, you fling it at somebody, they fling it back, okay, and then you might fling some more. A lot of energy wasted, okay? So, is that bad? Well, for every action, there is a reaction. That's a natural law. So, you're using that energy with emotions, and you're doing something to change. Okay? Um, mm, Yeah, you're going to have to deal with consequences, because for any action, there's a reaction. Okay? Now... The other thing with this is the best magicians, and I've been blessed to know many of them, okay, they will make mistakes. Even John would admit to me that he would enter into brass displays of power, certainly when he was younger, to prove something. And yet, while that sounds noble and, you know, you're you're floating out your cape in every direction, it's going to take its toll on you physically, and spiritually. So wasting your own energy on an idiot that um, sort of just crossed your path is never wise. Okay? So very, very, very important. I'm not against it if you curse, but there's so many other things you can do. One is protection rituals. Those are bindings, banishings, or spells. John and I call it the three B's in our book. I have expanded it to the four B's. Um, The first, of course, is burning. Someone leaves you and you have all these love letters. And what do you do with them? A lot of people will reread them and get angrier and angrier and your sadness is going to turn to more anger. That's Pugsley snoring, by the way, if you hear that in the background. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. And now... What are you going to do with this energy that you now worked yourself into a fit? Sometimes just by going out, and I'm not saying a um, forest fire. I'm talking about in a little pot, have a little fire, and burn, burn, burn. And as you're burning it, give it up to the air. Give up your energy, your anger, anything that was positive and negative about that relationship. Burn it out of you. Okay, not literally, just use it in a little pot, burn the love letters, and it's done. Maybe it's a note from somebody that um, wasn't the kindest to you. Burn it. Maybe you have a, a souvenir from a time when someone loved you and now they don't. Burn it. Okay? So burning is a very positive thing to do. Okay, the next thing is binding someone. Can it be done? Yes. Does it always have to be, quote, left hand path? Absolutely not. You can bind someone in very positive means. I have used binding to stop someone who um, was literally ruining their life. Okay, through alcohol and substance abuse. By binding that mouth and that arms, okay, I I did what I had to do, did an appropriate ritual, and slowly they were able to get help for their addiction, okay? Um, I, I'm a firm believer in binding. I've even bound people where it's sort of a mix of a protection ritual and binding, A lot of people know that I was into pro wrestling, and when I knew about a secret injury or something, I would be there binding my poppet. A poppet is just a representation of someone, a voodoo doll, if you will. And I'd bind it by wrapping and wrapping and say, this area is protected. No one can hurt this area. Did it work? Yeah. Did it probably help me better than them? Maybe. I'm not going to argue with you. But it got that scary energy out of me because I was worried about a friend. Another way to do this, and this is probably what I consider um, the best thing to do. Let's say you're dating Margaret. Your name is Joe. 
Margaret is just sort of off lately. In fact, she's doing things that you don't approve of, and she's been just acting off. Okay? You really don't want to deal with her right now, but you don't want to ruin the relationship. So, in a picture of Margaret goes into your ice tray and throw her into the freezer. Okay? What does that do? It freezes time. You're not stopping her from living her life. You're stopping her from causing you pain. Now, the next day, Margaret comes back and says to Joe, Joe, I am so sorry. You know, I was so upset. My dog was sick. My sister was sick out in L.A. I didn't know what to do. And I've really been treating you badly. Joe doesn't have to worry or even admit what he did. When he gets home, takes her out of the ice box, dries her off, hangs her up to dry in the <laughs> air, and Margaret and he are back to normal. Okay? I even had a friend who did this, and I'm not kidding you. The picture came out because he had laminated it, and he stuck it back on the wall, and she never knew the difference. Wow. Okay? And it went back into a beautiful romance. Okay? The fourth one I've added recently is something that I added, um, and I, it's very em, it, embarrassing to talk about, but after John left, you know, I was getting things fling, flang, and flung at me, and I was like, are you kidding me? And so instead of sitting around and using up my freezer or using up poppets or burning somebody, I figured the best way was to use a curse box. And this is seen in Germanic magic, and so I resonated with it. And what a curse box is, is you write their name out, and you put it in a box. Now, I have a very fancy wooden box. You don't need a fancy wooden box. Take any box that works for you. I've used ring boxes to make them for friends. You can use a lot of different things. Um, paint it as you wish. Tape it up so that it's not going to open. Cut a slit in the top. And um, with just enough room to grab something out of there with the tweezers. And so, you know, Margaret is teeing you off. Well, maybe she needs to go in the curse box. Now, understand, you say, I do not want Margaret bothering me right now. You write a nice ritual that she is no longer going to be in my life right now because she's causing me pain. The other thing about that is the minute that Margaret comes in and apologizes to you or you don't feel those painful feelings anymore, you can take her out of the box. Okay? Burning is over. Binding, you can fix it. Okay? Burring, throwing them in the freezer, eh, you can usually fix it. Um, boxing, you can certainly do. And don't forget burying. Okay? Sometimes we have to bury our feelings okay let's say when john was around i i was falling in love with someone else this didn't happen but it sounds good okay and so i would have taken a photo or my feelings written out on this person probably used a baby jar and um stuffed it in my backyard under one of the appropriate trees and buried it okay that is another way. Again, yeah, you can dig it back up if you want to, or you can leave it there remembering that that's how you felt at that particular time. So how do you get in this mode that you feel good about this? One thing John and I always agreed with, if you're going to work with magic or deflect magic coming at you, you cannot, I it's, you know, emphasize this, write this down. You cannot have a victim mentality. It will work against you every time, and that's when you hear about spells going horribly wrong. Okay? Stop blaming your own mistakes or omissions on someone cursing you. Maybe you just made a bad choice. We all do it. Maybe before we even decide what to do, you need to examine your consciousness and your responsibility in this situation. That's found in many spiritual traditions, and I strongly suggest it. And whether you like it or not, tear off your clothes and look at your part in the mess. Don't hide behind a mask. Because if you ask for justice and you were the cause of it, guess what? 
you have to own it and you've just cursed yourself. I like that. And um, <laughs> we're going to almost get ready to break, but there's a question from the sure. thing and let me find it back. Um, she said that she has a negative entity that has imposed himself on him and her husband. Okay. And she said, I've been given... I've been given advice on three different ways to get rid of it. I'm confused now. What to do? What do you suggest? Okay, if it's an entity, a non-corporeal being, you might want to sit down with a medium and find out if it's organic or not. Organic being, um, I dealt with this um, in a house that I was dealing with here in, in Syracuse. You need to know whether it is and, you know, an extra corporeal ghost, which it could be, or, or a thing that somebody flung, or if it's really psychological issues going to parapsychological issues, okay? Once you figure that out, and the medium has helped you figure out that, yes, there's something in this house, or no, this house is clear, then you can start to figure out what to do. I mean, if I had that situation, John and I had that situation a lot, and so we'd spread salt around. The dogs loved it, but, you know, uh, <laughs> we'd, we'd salt around the house. We would also definitely take ritual baths, okay? And another thing is if I find out that it's not a ghost, and it really might be the guy who wants my husband's job, okay, then I have to go to binding or burring, or even bearing, okay? I wouldn't burn, because until you find out exactly what the situation is, you don't want to get into that kind of situation. I like burning when it's you and someone else. You're in a dyad, right? Your best friend all of a sudden betrays you, something like that, and you'll never be able to, re to forget it. This is a situation where the more you know, the better off you are. And if it's annoying you and your husband, um, first really interview each other. And I know that sounds funny, but just the way a parapsychologist would. Okay, when did you start first start feeling it? Did you both feel it at the same time? When did it start happening? Look at a calendar. Was it weird weather that day? Was it a time where the, the house had a former fire? Do your research before you blame your husband or anybody else. And you will find there are things that come in the dark. And, yeah, you got to get rid of that. All right. I'm going to interrupt um, because we are going to take a break. We have a question, and I'll ask it when we come back from break. But, um, you know, you know Sarge. Um, he's waiting for us to get it done. Yes, it is. And, and because he produces both our shows, he's yes. probably very well versed in curses. Yes. So, yeah. So before he shows us how much he's learned from listening to our shows, um, everybody sit tight and we'll be back in two minutes. Way, there's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. I was in the hospital with my son for 18 months. When he got injured, I wasn't prepared, but I knew I had to be strong. When I was told about John's injury, I was in complete shock. I just remember rushing into his room and giving him a big hug and letting him know I was there. These veterans and families are just a few of the heroes we serve at Homes for Our Troops. For thousands of severely injured veterans, everyday life is filled with barriers. It was really the, the little things throughout the house. Counters that you can't roll up to. I had to drag my wheelchair down steps. I want to help, but he is so determined. At Homes for Our Troops, we build specially adapted custom homes with features like wheelchair access, rolling showers, and automatic door openers that allow them to function independently and focus on their recovery and family. This house is freedom. It's hope. It's a new beginning. This house has given me my family back. To learn more, visit HFOTUSA.org. As you go about your daily life, look closer. Every year across America, a staggering 4.2 million youth are homeless or trafficked. Covenant House is the national leader providing safe housing for youth 50 years strong. 
every youth who walks into Covenant House gets clean clothes, hot meals, medical care, and a safe place to sleep. So look closer at Covenant House and help us fight youth homelessness. To help or get help, go to covenanthouse.org. Hi, this is Marla, and if you're enjoying tonight's master class and you want to hear it again, you'll be able to find it at the show's YouTube channel, which is Stirring the Cauldron Para X. And it'll be up there, well, forever. <laughs> and you'll also find dozens of Stirring the Cauldron podcasts as well. And while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And whatever metaphysical area you're interested in, you'll find something to catch your eye, I'm sure. Well, thank you for listening in to tonight's class, and now I'll let you get back to your regular scheduled programming. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And our teacher for tonight's master class is Lily Ellie, and... Um, yeah, I'll give you the question that was on beforehand. If I get it back up, I'm sure I can. All right. Uh, um, he wants to know how does people? How do you feel? How do you feel about the idea that people curse others as a reactionary response to negativity interactions? Of course they do. Okay, we're human, and the best thing you can do is um, a. Prepare yourself for that crap and and don't fall into any kind of curse reverse and all that stuff when you don't have to. That's for the big guys, okay? Most guy people who just curse you, even if they curse you, you know, in public, all right, um, they got to get a lot more behind it than just saying, I curse you, okay? They have to be, you, you have to have that energy built up. And um, I would say... I, I prefer in those kind of situations wearing hematite or rose quartz. Um, hematite will deflect anything. As I always said, I wear a hematite um, ring. I buy them cheap and I, I wear them if I feel someone's coming at me. The negativity is absorbed by the hematite and guess what? It breaks when the problem's solved. Okay. Mm -hmm. And with rose quartz, it, it just is like a sort of... Um, protection for you and and the pet okay do it's not a protection whatever um he doesn't like any kind of you know this is you know john stuff um but the thing is as we look at these things you have to be very honest about it if you don't have some form of faith even if it's faith in yourself all right you're you're barking up a tree that you're not going to be able to do anything more about OK, you can worry about it, but not. And I would say the most important thing is a um, I once had someone shouting things at me. This was right after John died. And I just looked at them and very loudly said, I forgive you. And they just stopped. <laughs> OK. And I said, I forgive you for your stupidity. And I, you are not going to draw me into this crap. I, I have no interest in, you know, playing cursed games. I just don't have interest. I'm grieving. Go away. And, yeah, it was painful because I don't want to, when people come up to me and, and talk to me about John, I, I don't want to be negative. But if you're getting involved where, well, if I curse you, you know, go away. Okay. The thing and, is, protect yourself. I wear John's ashes around my neck. Okay, I'm pretty well protected. And and he had said that before he died. I had had a plot next to my plot ready to go. And for those who don't know, um, we went to hospice after 11 years that he had fourth stage cancer. And he and I talked about it. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to put you next to me and I'll join you, you know, hopefully not too soon. And he laughed at me and said, no, you're going to be all alone. I want you to have me cremated. Here's the necklace. And he had picked out the necklace. I want you to put me in there. And so not only do I have them in my house, I also have them around my neck at all times. 
And so that's one means of protection. Whether you wear a pentacle or a cross, that's another means of protection. Okay? But the thing is, like anything else, you have to believe in these protections. If you're feeling out of sorts and you don't believe in anything, well, I, I can't help you with that. Okay? If you're feeling victim mentality, don't mess with magic. Don't do it. You will not win in the end. And the other thing is, once you get known for knowing about curses, I just want to share with you, in John Alley's case, he got blamed for everything. OK, um, he was dying and I got a call from an author who had found out and I we were both very honest about it. In fact, I think we talked about it on my show one night that he had talked to one of the Columbine killers in a chat room. Before the actual event, OK. And what nobody realized was that. He and another person were trying to convince them that. Things will get better. You don't have to take action. And sometimes no action can be the best reaction to anything. And because there was no um, chat logs of that conversation, we had no proof that that's what was said. And I finally had to ask the author to cease and desist for implying that somehow this was caught up in Satanism. Um, I've also had people who ask me, and they don't seem to have a problem with coming up and asking me if John's use of magic had caused his cancer. Okay, do I know if that had? I don't. Okay, was there cancer in his family? There was. Okay, so me personally, I could say to you that his use of magic, you know, sort of affected his health. I know for me, Unless you've been one of my clients or you have a very strong reason, I don't do readings anymore because I'm getting older. And it takes a lot out of you. I don't care what anybody says. If you're doing what you need to do or if you're doing a house blessing and a house clearing, it takes a lot out of you. That doesn't mean I don't ever do it. But let's just say I'm a lot more careful than I used to be, if that makes sense. And one of the biggest problems that we saw with black magicians is that you have to take this energy, this power from something other than yourself for cursing. Do not use your personal power and do not use that of an other living creatures because those creatures, I, I know people who have tried to, you know, get their dog involved and all that. These creatures are innocents. They did not agree to be involved in your magic. And I will never agree with the use of innocence to prove a point, get power for ritual use. You don't do that. There is a law of eternal re, uh, of eternal return for that kind of situation. And that's in all religions. So if you want to get at someone with a curse, whether it be consciously or subconsciously hurting an innocent, that is never a good idea. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Um, I'll give you a, a as long as we have time, Marla, I'm going to throw examples in here, too. Sure. I worked with someone and John was alive. Then he helped me too, with someone who had flung a curse. OK, done a good job. But she wasn't trained on this. OK, and she managed to throw it at her friend and it affected the daughter. OK. And John couldn't figure out. He talked to her and he said, did you have any thoughts? She said, when I was so angry, I thought that daughter, that's what you care about, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? OK, and so not only did we work with her to reverse her curse, which can ha you can do, but also so that she for could forgive yourself. Now, think about that before you ever decide to curse. Can you live with yourself if you throw this curse? Many times you'll be able to say yes. Most times, however, you're saying you're going to say no way, no way. And so the thought of any hurting of an innocent is never a good idea and it will cause grief. Another thing John and I agreed on is that like in any self-defense, you let the aggressor take the first punch. Let them start it. You can certainly finish it. 
Now, again, if you're messing with children of the elderly, um, yeah, I, I'm going to get a little bit more medieval. But, um, you know, you also have to remember, what is the person's, I mean, we talk in law about mens rea, right? What is the person's state of mind who did this? Okay, if they're mentally ill, okay, I, I don't think that you need to blow them away with a curse. I mean, again, you can bind them so that they will get help. But I don't think you ever want to sit there and slam somebody who may not have even been in their right mind, literally. Okay? And bad spiritual behavior, I would say maybe 80% of the time, are people with mental health issues. Work on getting them to have those mental health issues resolved. Then you figure that out. Now, this this touches on the question you asked me, Marla. You see many people lashing out at others. They're using their own coping mechanisms to try to deal with the psych or psychological damage. Don't judge, but discern that you may just want to walk away. Okay? Um, what I always tell people to do is when someone has really wronged you, and you've done your examination of conscience, and you're, you're sitting there and you're going, oh, no, I can't forgive this. No, no. Okay, sit. Watch. And if it's bad, then send it back to them exactly what they sent to you. The truth mm -hmm. will come out. Sometimes just sending illumination will be most amusing. It may take a while, but focus, get your bag of popcorn, let the credits run, and the show will begin. All right, people say, well, isn't that still cursing? No, because when I do that, and that is a form of a curse, if you want to say that I do, is I make sure it can't reverse, and I, I put that into my... Um, if I told you what was going on right now, uh, Marla, you would freak out. <laughs> they're all looking at the door and barking, and there's nobody out there. But they're all right where John's ashes are. There you go. And I just don't know what they're doing. It's in the other room, and so I apologize for the um, the blast of the dogs. But the good news is Pugsley's still asleep. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're going to get into it even a little more deep as we look at John's actual statements, um, because his really... It, it, it points out the first thing about John was he was very into, and you remember this, Carla, free thought. Free thought holds that belief should be formed on the basis of science and logic and not be influenced by emotion, authority, tradition, or dogma. And he worried a lot about people using emotion you have to use your emotion when you're sending something like this, okay? But um, don't just make that false emotion. It has to be something going on. Now, he wrote, and I'm, I'm saying this in the first person, but it's not my words, they're John's, okay? I begin my lesson on magic, and most assuredly, there is a brain chorus of naysayers who will insist that I have no right to even address the issue until I can provide demonstrable evidence that such a thing exists. Well, let me use the analogy of a car. I open the door, I sit in the driver's seat, put the key in the ignition, turn it on, shift it into drive, and off I go. I'm not a mechanic. I have no idea how the fuel drives the pistons or what makes the motor work. I don't need to deliver a long discourse about the internal combustion engines. I just know it works. It gets me from point A to point B. And that's all that matters on my level and on your level when it comes to this. Now, the laws of physics may also apply to magic. We may learn that in years to come. How and why, I have no clue. I've acquired enough evidence to convince me to proceed with my magical operations. And what advice would I give to those who've experienced magic and have consistently failed to see any results? Simple. Stop doing it. If you perform something and it consistently fails, you're doing something wrong. Stop doing it. But this also does not give you the right to yell fraud and sham at other people who are getting success. Now, how is magic and what does it work? 
we always went with Alistair Crowley's definition of magic as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. And he included ordinary acts of will as well as acts of ritual mag magic. So, doing a blessing, if you want to call it that, or a positive magic, that's in this definition. But also included are things that are a little negative by some people's standards. Okay? And so, we know that the objective world can change our subjective world and what Carl Jung called our collective unconscious. This may explain why we're able to do these things. But again, you can read Jung, and certainly I would suggest that, but it's something that you need to understand. Cause and effect is a two-way street. Manipulating your imagination, dreams, and emotions will likewise influence or affect what transpires in the solid, real, objective world. This is the basis of magic, as above, so below. It works, but you must consider balance, direction, timing, and above all, intent. Okay? John never thought of, I'm putting this into you, John never thought of magic as supernatural okay um he always said it was electricity you use it to light and heat a room and it's wonderful or you can stick your finger in a light socket and kill yourself okay magic is the same thing whether it's used to heal or or kill if you use it to inflict harm that is a curse if you use magic to heal that's a blessing. Some people go as far as saying a prayer. I always say projection. Because what's a better way to deal with people? If I project on you positivity, I often send many of my friends, especially with what's going on in the world today, pink light if they're anxious. Okay? Why? Because that calms us down. Okay, that's a blessing. Now, if I send something else to them, not so nice. One of the stories that I witnessed personally, and um, it was very painful for me, was um, someone went out of their way to hurt John without just cause, okay? There was a male who was very jealous of um, John's relationship with me. Now, he did everything he could, explained, you know, that it, it didn't affect our friendship that all of a sudden I was with John. OK, but um, then came the magic spells and spreading hateful gossip. And he even tried to extort property from John and he'd had enough. OK, so John looked at the individual. He studied and evaluated all the reasons for the hostility. When he realized that. He saw that this was a very. Um, sad, destructive person with substance abuse problems, okay, who the history was, while he wanted to be happy, he would tend to lash out at those who were truly happy. So he did a binding spell, not a curse, and he visualized a cocoon around the person and kept repeating mentally, you can hurt no one but yourself now. The harm you do to others will be mirrored back. What this binding did was give him two options, okay? And that's the best thing you can do, is always give freedom, okay? He could confront his psychological issues and affect permanent change or continue to his ways. Um, unfortunately, this gentleman died, and I, I have never gotten over it because I, I witnessed it, okay? The binding John performed was not miraculous, okay? And we can't say, oh, my curse worked. Because the person deep down was probably suicidal to begin with. As John said, all you need to do with a binding sometimes is give people a psychic push. But he always said, when binding, give them the option, okay? That push can send you to getting help or the push can send you into your own abyss um 
when John explained it as this, the balance of nature was clearly on my side. So was there was no terrifying cosmic reper, repercussion or threefold return. It was something that had to be done. John also adds in this, you can't curse a person living an honest, authentic existence who is true to themselves and others. Why would you curse someone like this? Are you not allowing them to make mistakes? So you have to be careful in throwing that curse. And in fact, be very, very careful that you're not the one with the defective personality because it can come back. It'll boomerang on you. Now, people would also often ask him, how do you feel about throwing a curse? And he described it as this. It is cathartic because you are releasing pent up hostility. The secret is once you get it out of your system, let go and forget about it. Don't hold it. And that's what I like about the curse box, that I can leave it in there and not even do anything actively, but know it's there. The point is to let go and let nature take its course. You don't want to worry about the, the outcome, and certainly you don't want to think about the spell. That's bittering away the potential stored up energy, okay? And you should have been done that with your examination of conscious. The best way to do any spell is to always visualize the outcome. Put your thoughts, energies, feelings into the end result. Then let nature decide the course of events leading to the desired result. Once you've performed the spell, it's out of your mind. Two weeks later, if you just feel like you need to perform it again, do it. But again, forget about it entirely. Now, the biggest fear. Am I going to screw up the wrong person? Well, first of all, if you're asking yourself that, you lack self-confidence or have issues, and you should not be performing magic at all. And if you find yourself so angry and all-consuming that you're blaming their workplace, their kid, um, no, stop, okay? He tells the story of his friend Roger. Roger was in one of his occult study groups, and Roger fell in love with Dolores. Now, Dolores was very beautiful, but she had her own issues, and she was using Roger to get revenge on Roger's wife. They had had an issue in college. Well, he was so smitten with Dolores, he immediately told his wife he was through, left her with three kids, and ran off with Dolores. Well, about six weeks later, Dolores lost interest and threw Roger out of her apartment. He was devastated. Think about it. He lost everything, his wife, his children, and now his lover. Instead of blaming his own poor judgment or weak character, Roger blamed Dolores for everything and anything. And so he performed a powerful destruction ritual upon her. The next morning, he felt he woke up and he was con completely devastated and consumed and desperate. He didn't listen to anyone else and began stalking Dolores. He actually accosted her. She filed a restraining order and two weeks later, Roger was arrested and spent some time in jail. So if you do it right, the curse will always affect the right person. The one who is the weakest link psychologically is the right person and depending on how you set it up it just may be you roger created and cursed himself does that make sense carla any other questions i marla any other questions um no I'm, I'm just looking and looking and going up and down and back and forth no but you know um we've got like uh, <clears throat> three or four minutes but you know whenever i tell people <laughs> and they don't like it. But, you know, we throw out curses every day and we don't even know about it. Yes. And that, then that, yep, just our breath, just our yeah. thoughts. Okay. Yeah. It's a good thing there aren't thought police, right? Mm -hmm. So it, all of us would be in jail once a day. True. Yeah. But, right. I mean, it really is true. And um, then people, some people that hear that, they start freaking out. Oh, my God. I can't talk. I can't say anything. You know, and so, yeah. So what do you tell people not to be afraid of that or just how do you control it? Because sometimes we just 
open our mouths and talk and, you know, things fly out. Yep. Yep. I mean, when you get into the curses, they're messy. Okay? Innocent lives sometimes are even lost, despite a magician's claim of pinpoint accuracy. Um, I, and I'm just going to leave, uh, I'll say, say this very quickly. With John, in the old days of the internet, he and another very, very talented magician um, did a curse off and cursed each other. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sadly, John won the curse. And it haunted him for the rest of his life. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Did anybody else agree to that curse off? This was before my time, so I wasn't involved in this. Okay. But did anybody else, did he consider either of them, consider anybody else when they threw these curses at each other? Okay. Even though they both lived with people and, in, you know, had families. No. So what ended up happening is you could even say that the gentleman who died was buffered. He died. But what about his family? What about his wife? Okay. Mm -hmm. And John always says to me, you know, like a five-year-old, well, he started it. And yeah, okay, he did. All right. But you mm -hmm. agreed to it. And both sides had their victims. It was one of the reasons I almost never got together with him. I've known John since I met him when I was 25, okay? And um, it, it was one of the reasons that I just was like, wow, this guy's a little too volatile for me. <laughs> because, I mean, if he can do that, and, and people laugh because I say, I wasn't afraid of being cursed, okay? It wasn't that. But I, I don't want to get the blowback. OK, I, I'm going to be have to have shields instead of just protection, nice little fluffiness. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to remember, even if the curse is successful, there are innocent people who can and will be affected. OK, you say, um, all right, I really wish this guy would just leave town. And that sounds like a nice, easy curse, is it? What about his wife? Is she going to leave town? We don't know. What about his older mother, who he's taken care of in town? Now what did you do? Marla, you know, now what did we do with that? Okay? Mm -hmm. And so I always say to people, there are there are certainly times that you do a curse. Um, would the I'm going to get a curse from, from Sarge in a uh -oh. minute. Yep. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> so um, really quickly, um, let everybody know. And and people can stay right here and listen to it, and she can finish that over on her her yep, end. I will. That would I, be I good. Yep. Yeah. So um, thank you. I'm really glad that you were here, and we'll do. We've got to do some more of this stuff because it's okay. Yeah, I need part two already. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, I owe you a big apple for the teacher. Um, would you prefer oh, yes. one with? I'm finding it right now. Well, did you want the one with the big juicy worm or no worm? No worm is preferable. Okay. All right. And we'll thank everybody else for listening in as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry made again. Good night. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Stirring the Cauldrons Masterclass. Please join us at the same time for another great class and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2024. The Holiday Weasel by Kevin McLeod is licensed through Incompetech.